Well, thank you, John. Um, I'm excited to be the first presenter this morning. Um, I, like John said, uh, I've spent 26 years building tactical radios with Harris um, and uh, came into Harris with a computer science degree. So um, I thought I'd start kind of at the beginning. And the, the beginning for me is uh, with shipboard radios. So Harris made gray radios first. We, we talk about a transition from gray to green. Um, and, and when I started, I was walking into, a little bit of feedback here. Um, I was walking into an organization that was full of very passionate radio people. I think that's what you folks all are. Um, and I was walking in as the data guy. So I was, you know, I was that kid, the geek, the, you know, what is that guy talking about? Bits and bytes. Um, but at this point um, in my career, I was working on mainly control systems, uh, controlling these radios. And the data itself was a point-to-point -point kind of data. Um, the primary communications was all voice. And the systems were multiple pieces of equipment. So you were looking at transmitters, receivers, modems, the encryption devices, everything was separated individual components and, and could be worked on relatively easily. So the data, 75K, yeah, 75 baud, right? <laughs> that was fast, that was a big deal. Right, that teletype machine was something that I saw when I was out there. So, um, you know, I, I would go out and troubleshoot these systems all around the world. I, I used to think that it was because I was good that Harris sent me out there. I, I realized pretty quickly that it was because I was young, <laughs> I wasn't attached, and I said yes. So, I, I got to go out and, and really see a lot of these systems and work on some pretty simple problems. Um, one you'll see on the bottom here, uh, for those of you computer science folks, the classic stack uh, versus a queue. You have to implement this kind of in your earliest days of computer science. At least I think you still do. And we had an intersite communications link using microwave, tying our big systems together. And that link, that system was built up in Harris and Rochester tested for over a year and a half, and then fielded. And the Intersight Communications link was flawless, worked great. But when we got it out there in the field, there was something strange going on. And I was sitting there trying to tell engineers all the way across the ocean what was happening with their system. As it turns out, the Intersight Communications link, although in the comments, said it was a queue. It was actually implemented as a stack. When you take that communications link and you test it in the lab side by side with no delay and no error, a stack, as long as it's the first one in, the first one out, looks just like a queue. But as you start to field these things and the code starts to really be stressed, all of a sudden, a stack really shows up. And I was sitting there saying, it looks like things are coming in backwards. <laughs> Rochester would not believe me. I would send these printouts of the messages. They, they didn't believe me. Finally, someone put some delay in the system and actually exercised it and realized that our Intersight queue, and, and back then it was called Pitcher and Catcher, um, was actually a stack. So th these were the data problems that I started on and cut my teeth on. And these radios <coughs> that we're building today, uh, as you see on the right, the MPRC 117G, um, it's a radio that was built to address uh, the emerging requirements of the JTRS program. We started on it in 2003, and what it does is incorporates <coughs> all of those pieces of equipment into a single device. That device does 30 to 2 gigahertz. It actually has three RF spigots on it there, and you can 
you can see that what, what we're doing is we're, we're able to combine VHF, UHF, and even L-band out of a single device that is only about 8.2 pounds. So when you do that, when you push everything together in the data world, again, where I come from, those data protocols can get a lot closer to the RF. We, we put requirements on the RF to turn in microseconds now. It's to turn, tune, and, and be on air. Um, it, it enables a ton of more accurate coordination from the receive and transmit side of things. In those larger sites, you have intersight, communications links, uh, everything takes time. There's a lot of latency, a lot of delay. A lot of that is removed. Um, and where I came on developing on that ANPRC-117G was in ad hoc protocols. So back in 2003, ad hoc protocols were in academia. There were 40 different methods that we went off and studied and evaluated to try to figure out what's the right protocol to put in this radio. There were people out there saying they could put thousands of nodes on air on a single frequency. As we learned, that really wasn't true, wasn't really possible. You could do it, but you could then not put any data across it. And, and it was something we learned even back in HF with automatic link establishment, uh, those types of things working in HF. Once you put a, a whole bunch of nodes out there, before too long, they're all doing link quality and trying to figure out what the best link is and nobody's sending any data. So there's a huge balancing act here between the overhead and the data. And so these ad hoc protocols, um, we spent a ton of time investigating that, working through those things um, and, and trying to uh, figure twice over now, um, but it hasn't changed. When you look at the requirements to support a tactical battle space and you think about <coughs> satellites, aircraft, folks on the ground, um, and the various ways that they need to communicate, it's just mind-blowing. And what we've found is that the more information they have, the faster, the better they can do their mission. And more information means data. It's not just voice anymore. It's a huge amount of data, sensor data. Um, and Nirvana, the sensor data, is actually images or live video. And as we all know, video is an incredible bandwidth hog. And doing that in a tactical environment where you have very limited bandwidth is the, the biggest challenge that we have. So I tried to kind of push all the layers. Excuse me, I'm going to grab my water for a second. I normally walk when I talk, so I'm, I'm getting tied to this microphone, <laughs> but it's okay. 
Um, so our, our physical layer, um, and, and I've had the, the pleasure of working with probably the most advanced scientists in the world. Um, my early days of doing HF communications, the uh, ARQ <coughs> protocols, working with Dan McCray, um, I didn't even know. You know, people said to me, oh, you worked with Dan McCray. I, yeah, I did. Um, Bill Furman, John Nieto, some very prolific inventors in HF. Um, and, uh, you know, those, those guys took their HF knowledge and they pushed it. They just pushed it into the UHF domain and have created these robust physical layers that our ad hoc networking can ride on. It's, it's um, you know, it's something where I've been spoiled uh, to, to have folks like that in radio to work with them because the techniques that we use to get the data across the air doesn't matter. regular old CPUs, GPPs, general purpose processors, we're pushing that, that information all the way down the stack as well, down into the fastest parts of the software-defined radio. Channel management, packet overhead, I talked a little bit earlier about that. It's always a challenge. The, you, can, you can invent all kinds of really neat ways to manage the channel, but that information has to flow between the nodes, and to do that, you're going to start to impact the overall data overhead. And so this balancing act, the, the push and pull between overhead and actual usable data is probably the biggest challenge that, that we face doing these mesh networks, the ad hoc networks in the battle space. So uh, there are a lot of methods out there where, where people have developed for the wired world. And we do take advantage of those, but they, they don't really translate well when you push them into a space where your latency can go from milliseconds to seconds and back to milliseconds, and, and it happens just as fast as I'm snapping my fingers. These, these applications that are out there that work over a wired world or even a fixed infrastructure world where I kind of have a dedicated link. I know how it's going to behave. You, you tune your, your network and you're good. In, in the tactical battle space, that network is always changing and everything has to change with it. So I think everybody has seen this. Voice is data now. So there's there's a huge amount of combination of that information. The prioritization of that voice versus the data, those streams have to be tagged. You get back into overheads, um, as well as voice requires a little bit of a different handling. So, um, you know, I think we've all seen the emergence of Skype meetings. Uh, early Skype was uh, just echoey and really difficult to deal with. Well, imagine doing that over a, over a tactical link, over a link where um, you, you, you really cannot control the path at all. It's going to change underneath you. 
it's still a struggle. Some of, the, some of the video communications that we do over these links feel like early Skype right now. Um, and then lastly, the software communications architecture. Um, Software-defined radio, it's all the rage. Um, and, and uh, you know, that, that communications architecture does enable a lot of good practice in building radios, but it also brings on overhead. There's, there's a lot of just um, the management of the overall radio, APIs, et cetera, is overhead. And all of this translates to compute power. So, um, as I said, I'm the data guy, um, but I know you guys are probably more towards that physical later, layer radio guys, so I couldn't do a presentation without talking to the physical layer. Um, ultimately, the physical layer is really being pushed in the tactical battle space as far as capacity. And what's pushing that is full motion video. It is, it is kind of the, the ultimate end game for information. If I can see what's going on, then I know what I can do. And the, the, um, the expectation of all data is that I'm going to get my, my classic commercial internet response out there on the tactical battle space. And that's the expectation. I should be able to just, if I need to search anything, I should be able to search it from wherever I am. These networks that we are standing up and, and the requirements on them uh, don't really allow you to get that type of response all the time. And ultimately, it's not just about the capacity. Everybody you know, wants more. I want more. That's the, I, I think it was an AT&T ad or something, a little girl going, I want more, I want more. We, we always hear about, give me more bandwidth, give me more data. In this world, that's one piece. It's one small piece of it. The adaptability of this physical layer, it's key. It has to be adaptable. You have to be able to work a channel when it's good with you know, the, the modulation schemes that, that you'll see at the top. And then adapt all the way down into the most robust modulation schemes that are below the noise. It's, it's key to providing connectivity all the time. We have to be connected always. Lastly, security. And, and this is a big deal. Um, and I'm really excited for the presentation on the Enigma machine because it's kind of where it all started. Um, but ultimately, security is not just the encryption of the data. Um, and security with the physical layer does have to do with detection and intercept. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on my security chart. Um, the Mac layer, um, so as you might imagine, being the engineer, this is the one that has the most words because this is where I lived for the longest time. Um, and uh, the, the rack that you see there on the right is actually a test rack full of our radios um, instrumented with computers to collect uh, all of the information that our radios are, it, it's debug information so that we can test our networks. So what we do, we start with simulations of our networks, um, and, and those are just computer simulations. You move the nodes, you look at the amount of, of information that is overhead, the amount of information that is data, um, and the amount of information that is ultimately just IP overhead. So a lot of these are IP networks. So when I say overhead at the start, it's control overhead. That information to just manage this channel is, is data that we need to understand. When you develop an ad hoc network and you create some chaos in that network, the network has to manage itself. What you'll see is the information starts to come up with respect to managing that network channel, and then it'll dial back down. When it does that, your ability to send data reduces. So we've We've analyzed these networks in simulations, then we take them into the labs, and we, we actually, these, are, these radios are all tied into an RF network that is controllable, so we can create any topology that we want. We can string these radios out one by one, we can create them fully meshed, or any other connectivity, and we do that 
dynamically as the radios are operating and we monitor their behaviors. We go out in the field, we create that exact same scenario as best we can. As you all know, in the world, it's not controllable. You know, the, the RF space, you can just end up parked next to the wrong building and the noise that, that comes off of that building creates a, a whole different scenario than what you can do in the lab. But we, what we do try to do is reproduce those field scenarios, bring them back to our labs so that we can really create some level of rigor behind the networks that we field. The bottom line on tactical communications is that some level of guaranteed communications has to be there. If I can see another node in my network, I need to provide the ability for that radio to communicate. It is key to what we do. Our end users need to be able to clamp down on that handset and talk. So it's paramount and as we start to see algorithms come out, contention resolution algorithms regularly hit our trade space. We don't believe that's really the right algorithm because there's too much um, unknown with that algorithm once you add either more nodes or more traffic and I'm starting to contend for the channel, I could be backed off by minutes. And in a tactical environment, minutes mean lives. So it's, it's really important to us to have our tactical network scale down to a level, but never go below that level of always connected. It, it puts a little bit of interesting twist on the bottom line comms as, as you provide them. Um, QoS, it's, it's nearly impossible to provide a, any type of guaranteed quality of service. You can certainly look at what the applications are requiring, but to provide it in a, in a space where your network is just so variable, it's almost impossible. Um, and the bottom line here is that we are, we are looking all the way up into the applications because the applications need to understand what's underneath them. A lot of middleware has been developed to try to keep applications alive. Um, folks that use TCP IP, um, if you're in that world, you understand what I'm talking about. Um, it's, it's something that we regularly look at and ultimately um, work with end users. And Harris now um, is, is working in that application space as well and developing the full system from the top to the bottom. So encryption again at the Mac layer. So these secure radios, they're able to carry top secret traffic and that encryption needs to be over the packet overhead um, as, as well as just the data. Why do you need that? Well, you, you want to cover even the, the information that is uh, potentially identifying a node in the network. That information, if I were to intercept it and it wasn't covered, and I always saw this node A, node A, node A, hmm, every time node A is doing something, something happens. This, this kind of cat and mouse game that's out there, we have to think about it from every single layer. So um, every layer has some element of security that it has to be concerned about. So here we go, security. Um, these are just a few of the terms that are out there in the industry, low probability of detect. The, the physical layer is, is key in providing that. And your lowest probability of detect, I just gave it to you. <laughs> Don't transmit. And the least amount of time that you're on air, the better. And then of course, the lowest power that you put out, the better. So that low probability of detect is a key element of the physical layer and it's very important. It is a security element. So low probability of intercept, it's also down there. It, it crosses the layers of the physical layer and the MAC layer. Someone intercepts your packet, even if they don't know because it's completely covered by Enigma, well, covered by something like Enigma. You don't want them to play it back. If they play it back into your system, 
you want to have the ability to detect that someone is trying to to interfere in that way so that intercept is not just can they intercept it can they read the information in it you you want that information to be so unintelligible that they don't understand any information about who's sending it and as well you want to be able to tell if someone is playing that information back into your system that it's not right so that intercept is again a key part of the physical layer but it starts to ride up into the Mac layer because of that uh, the playback type of things um, transec so the transmission <coughs> security um, I've talked about the cover at the Mac layer but even within the physical layer there's some transmission security where we can be agile and we can we can create some level of never being on the same frequency at the same time with pseudo random types of methods um, that's great but guess what try to receive that on the other side try to align those things um, huge amounts of science into figuring that out um, and as as I talked through those three elements think about what that does to hey I just want to get the data from point A to point B it's going to dramatically reduce the amount of information that you can send over that link it's it's completely counter to communications security just regularly will impede our ability to communicate but it's imperative because if they're not secure they're at risk comsec that's just your standard data cover and nowadays let's talk about cybersecurity right IPsec these radios have become networking devices and they use IP you mean to speed up or talk up can't hear me all right I'll move forward on the mic hand signals work too in the communications world <laughs> as long as we have line of sight being first we can always we, we get to fine-tune everything here so so um, here's here's a, 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 a radio that we are now fielding um, this is the AMPRC 158 so this is the next generation from your AMP 117 G that I showed you earlier the 117 G is a single channel radio able to do 30 to 2 gigahertz what we've now done is taken two 117 G's effectively and put it into this box this box does 30 to two and a half gigahertz on either side the channels are fully simultaneous so you're able to run any waveform on either side of this radio um, you're looking at a, a, a 10 megahertz wide capable channel six to eight hours of battery life battery life is hugely important so when I was talking to you early about the FPGA technologies the DSP technologies the GPPs and all of the MIPS and memory all of that is going to eat batteries those of you familiar with with your your cell phone you do an update of the software what does it do it eats more batteries same is true here as we update software as we start to really exercise hardware battery life is a major concern our users out there are are very very concerned about the amount of weight that they carry so much so that they won't carry a radio if they have to carry too many batteries they'll they'll just say I I, I, I can do comm some other way I'll communicate when I get back to my vehicle um, so it's very important um, in this trade space that we don't create something that is unusable just from a battery life perspective um, it does have the, the ability to do wideband and narrowband so we're talking about you know this channel that's 10 megahertz wide can also run all the way down to an 8.33 kilohertz to do an air traffic control channel so it's a tremendous amount of flexibility and I don't pretend to know how the, uh, the RF guys right at the front end of that radio do it but they do it all out of one spigot it's 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 really impressive um, 
they've on our 117 G like I said we had three RF spigots where we had effectively three PAs able to do VHF UHF and our SATCOM waveforms it's now all off of one antenna so um, a tremendous amount of work in shrinking all of that and getting it to the almost the exact same size as our 117 G um, this one is 8.8 .8 pounds the 117 G is 8.2 pounds so for point four pounds more two full radios in this box able to run uh, you know 10 watts and 20 watt peak in SATCOM the waveforms in this radio for those of you familiar with um, the uh, the good old days sinkars it's still there is that what we were trying to come up with um, it, it is still used um, and we Harris now Harris and Excellus ITT um, have the full install base of all of the legacy Syngars radios as well as these new radios capable of running Syngars. The new waveform is SRW. That's the Soldier Radio Waveform. It is a wideband networking waveform developed by the Army. You can go out to, uh, you know, search JHRS and SRW and learn quite a bit about what they've done with that. Um, it is fielded in this radio. Um, DEMA and IW, the SATCOM waveforms that have been there forever. Um, VULOS, uh, just a VHF UHF line of sight. We, we say VULOS. Um, it's just a <laughs> What is that VULOS? Sometimes people say MANA. Um, it's not a French word. It's a mobile ad hoc networking um, These are these are things that when when we get into the tactical world um, It's all alphabet soup um, but um, The waveforms themselves are have been there. They're solid uh, have quick ANW2, um, that's kind of where I cut my teeth in ad hoc networking um, and, and spent a ton of time uh, developing ad hoc networks. We started small. Um, we worked from some of, the, uh, some of the fielded requirements at the time. In 2003, there were uh, requirements within the JHRS as well as um, even over in Sweden, Denmark, they had requirements for wideband networking. We kind of merged them all together and s and built what we thought was going to hit at least the basic mark of networking what we found was that the requests that were out there were trying to boil the ocean um, and so we started small and worked up as opposed to with that that big broad picture um, now that boiled ocean comes in in the wideband networking waveform WNW we do have that fielded on our 117 G um, and it, it is fully capable of being uh, run, run on this radio. MUOS is the mobile user objective system um, that is right now uh, in development. It is a, the next generation of satellite systems. We have uh, run that on this radio. We've implemented it. We're, we're actually uh, certified and running it on our 117G right now. Uh, so um, that the, what we do at Harris is we always try to integrate and um, evolve our, our technologies. So we will implement on one platform and move software back and forth between them. So uh, the, the key here is to build hardware that's capable of supporting these waveforms. We've done an analysis here. You can see all the waveforms on the right in hardware support. We know this radio can run any of those waveforms. When we built our 117G, the MUOS waveform was just a twinkle. And we built that radio capable of running that waveform. We did our best to understand the requirements of it and built to it. So um, the bottom line here is keep it simple. I know what I just went through is very complicated and very complex. But the bottom line is we're delivering this to a soldier, and that well, soldier enough. has a lot have more to do than just uh, run equipment array that has two channels. So, so when you take um, it seems those two channels, two channels with them into your one box, box. And, and you need to control them, you end up with very interesting trades. Um, and ultimately, we would want to make it bigger. 
what really drove this, I have to go back to uh, my 117G days, A and W2, one of our first customers, uh, I was doing the briefing on the ad hoc networking and a much more intense brief, very deep into how ad hoc networking worked in the radio at the time, the ANW2 waveform, showing nodes coming and going and how the data relayed through the network. And I thought it was cool. It was great, right? It was the coolest thing. They're gonna love this. And the, the, the user was sitting there with that 117G just clutching it. And, and, and I thought, yeah, I sold them the network good right and and you know any any salesman worth their salt says okay I need to know why that guy's holding that radio that way because I got to get all my customers doing that and and so the salesman asked what what's the deal why 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 do you love this radio so much and the, the guy said because it's small that was it because it's small so when we went after two channels we knew we had to hit this form factor the guy was a paratrooper, by the way. <laughs> so, I, I mean, he, he jumped with radios. It's, it's yes, two sir. Things, small and works. Amen. Yes. <laughs> I've, had, I've had short of small, but it doesn't work out in the jungle in Vietnam. That's not the answer. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. I agree. And that, that is that, that balancing act. So, I know you wanted to do questions, John. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this to the end here. Um, with one more story, and we'll we'll flip over to questions. And John, keep you're keeping the time. Um, the the guys uh, on the on the bottom right there are uh, NATO peacekeepers. I had the uh, I had the pleasure to talk to some of those guys early in my career. Well, I guess middle of my career, <coughs> and, and uh, these were the guys that were tied to the fence in Serbia. And that's why we do our job. It's really what this is all about. Those guys, had they had the right communications, they called back into NATO headquarters on the phone. Nobody answered because it was on the weekend. Um, it, it's, you know, there were a lot of mistakes in that one, but ultimately, this is why we do radio. This is, this is what our mission is. So um, with that, <coughs> we got any reserve, active, retired in the room, salute to troops. I thank you all for your service. We can open to questions. Yes. So early on you said that you, you've made the choice to go with an ad hoc network for primarily for keeping a low profile. My understanding of ad hoc networks and mesh networks in particular is that they don't scale very well. Yeah. The more devices you have, the more people are chattering on essentially the same channel. Um, do you have some clever way of dealing with that, or is that just something that you accept in view of uh, the security needs? No, there's, there's absolutely a clever way of dealing with that. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I really am not at liberty to, to reveal what we're doing. But, um, <laughs> but, but you're absolutely right. The, the ad hoc networks are chattery. They're always on air. Um, and it is a huge concern. Um, and ultimately, if you impose upon them that requirement, the LPD, I, I went silent for a reason in the briefing, that's the key. You, you, need to, you need to remove that chatter, but still be able to maintain that network. Yes. Oh, you, sir. Oh. You have a, yeah. Uh, so, roughly speaking, what does one of these units cost? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know as I'm, I'm at liberty to re reveal that being recorded. So, uh, you know, I, th I think, um, as you might imagine, there's there's a fair amount of cost in this radio um, for it to survive the military environment. The, um, the these have requirements all the way up into ballistic shock, um, and uh, the amount of science that's in these radios um, they are expensive. Um, I you know I I guess when when you look at um, some of the programs out there. 
you can the the JTRS program itself um, is is a multi-billion dollar program um, that is looking to field about 70,000 of these systems so I think if you want to do the math there you can start to figure out what it costs anything else Yes. Are you still doing things in ALE in the HF part of the band, say two megahertz to thirty? Yes, we are. We absolutely are. Um, and in fact, we are designing a brand new radio that uh, has wideband HF um, up to wideband HF. By the way, is twenty-four kilohertz wide, not like these <laughs> ten megahertz wide radios. Um, and uh, we're, we're getting to um, what I would call dial-up types of data performance on those HF links, which starts to make folks think about it replacing the, uh, the traditional SATCOM. So it's, it's exciting times. I know I didn't answer your ALE, but um, there are link establishment methods that we're looking at as well there in, in HF with, with that wideband technology. Mm -hmm. uh, this is around the equipment I have at home on HF. I'm beginning to see some very interesting waveforms, particularly in the fixed service spec sections of the spectrum. And uh, when you when you when you do a waterfall, you know, just a, a simple analysis. It depends about as simple as you can get. There's a lot going on in there. It just, I don't think it's LTE, but uh, I see some things are popping up, and I have a secret suspicion. That could be, could be. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I haven't spent much time with the HF gang in probably 10 years. So my, my HF days kind of stop at Fed Standard 1052 with ARQ um, and, and the, you know, the original ALE. Um, we did do some level of, of um, interesting LPI, LPD work back then. Um, and, and that all continues to progress and, and move forward and, and the, the guys just are um, continuing to advance the science. It's, it's pretty impressive right now, the, the new radio coming out, uh, there's a ton of interest in it. Any more questions? Yes. I'll just make a comment. I, I was over in Kuwait when when they came in for General Frank's command cell, they brought us 20 Singars radios. And uh, this was 1992. Mm -hmm. And I went into, I was the contractor equivalent of the, of the dome, the signal officer of Kuwait. And I went into the young major's office and I said, well, what about the, uh, the thousand BRC-12 radios we've got uploaded in this brigade set? I said, I think we're not on the contract because I just got my signal magazine that says, Singar's fielded worldwide. <laughs> and so uh, he, it was in the afternoon, which was morning here, so he, he called his friend back at the uh, contract desk at Fort Mama, and she's looking, and she's looking on the speakerphone, and she's looking, and she says, oh my God. And so the point is, with all of this wonderful interoperability, if you leave the reserves behind, if you leave the National Guard behind, if you leave the most forward deployed brigade combat set in the U.S. Army sitting 60 miles from Saddam Hussein off the list, or if there's no will in Congress, my point is, for an infantryman who had to share cleaning rods on M16s in Vietnam in his squad because we didn't have enough, if there's yep. no will in Congress, and we all need to understand this, this is all us. Um, radios and, and, and new rifles are not as sexy as, as big aircraft carriers. And they right. tend to fall off the end of the table from funding. And, and I think it's really critical. I think we, we find ourselves in the military 
exactly where all of the first responders are that we'll hear some more about later today, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Where's the will? You, know, you got to get it done. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely. Um, I've seen it. I've, I've been there where um, I, I've talked to folks and said, hey, where's our radio? And they said, well, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't provide that to us yet. Um, I've talked with you know, friends of mine that are in, and, and, and they'll say, hey, Charlie, can you stop by and bring that new radio that we might see? <laughs> and it's always that we might see. It, it's, it's painful. Um, and and I, I do agree with you. We, we do need to find quicker, better ways of, of getting more equipment to the right places um, because, because of, that, of that issue. Um, one last thing, John. Uh, this week my daughter said to me, I can't wait to be done with school so I don't have to ever be, take another test. And I said, I said, Meg, we're going to get graded through our whole life. So be kind on the grading. <laughs> Thank you.